You are listening to Proof of Love with Tatiana Moroz, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz. This show may contain adult content, language, and humor and is intended for mature audiences. If that's not you, please stop listening. Nothing you hear on Proof of Love is intended as financial advice, legal advice, therapy, or really anything other than entertainment. Please take everything that you hear with a grain of salt. Oh, and if you're hearing us on an affiliate network, the ideas and views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the network that you're listening on or of any of the sponsors or affiliate products that you may hear about on the show. Now that that's squared away, let's start the show. Show me your heart. Thank you to our sponsor, Metal Pay, where you can send money anywhere easily and for free while earning crypto. Use the code Tatiana Show to earn even more. MetalPay.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Proof of Love. That's right. It's the crypto show that mixes technology and the heart. I don't have a tagline yet, but that's all we've got so far. I'm really <laughs> That's excited. a pretty good one. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. We're working on it. This is only our third show that we're doing. Um, joined with Stephanie Murphy and Lauren Kasovitz. Hey, ladies. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good, good. I don't know if I should have given you the doctor title, Stephanie, but if you... No, uh, are, that's okay. I'm doctor on the podcast. That's totally fine. <laughs> I like you being the doctor. It makes us seem more official. Yes, I agree. Exactly. And I mean, in case anyone's wondering, I'm a doctor of biochemistry. It's not of psychology. I'm not a therapist or anything like that. But I, I think I have maybe like life coach level qualifications, at least. I've been doing relationship shows for over a decade and I'm really interested in relationships and I read about psychology and relationships a lot. So that's, those are my credentials. Take it for what you will. <laughs> Close enough. I like to consider my credentials, the blind leading the blind. The lady <laughs> would not allow me to be this, this to be the, uh, the, the headline for the show or whatever, because they claim they're not blind, but I have no claims. And neither <laughs> are you, N neither are you, you have a lot of enlightened things to say. Maybe we could just call it the blonde leading the blonde because that's close enough to all of our hair color. I, I like, like that. Yeah. <laughs> we got to get you some sun, Stephanie. And yeah. we'll, we'll get some sun in. My mother <laughs> used to put sun in in my hair when I was in fourth grade. I think that's oh a little God. young. Yeah. <laughs> she wanted yeah. a little blondie princess early on. <laughs> I started in seventh grade, but it came out a little bit orangey. <laughs> Maybe they've made some improvements. How about you, Lauren? For people who haven't heard from you, a little hello would be nice. Give them a little background. Hello. Um, I don't have any official relationship expertise, but I've been in a lot of serious relationships. And I think I'm kind of the go-to muse of sorts if I toot my own horn for all my younger friends and people looking for some advice. And I am naturally blonde. So there you go. Nice. All of our secrets are being revealed <laughs> on this show, ladies. Um, okay. So we were talking about what we wanted to cover and we were talking a lot about long distance relationships and dating on the road because, you know, we've all been doing uh, a lot of travel, at least I have. So I'm always trying to date on the road, which is difficult. Uh, the girls have had some long distance experience. So I thought that might be a fun topic. What do you girls think? Oh, yeah. I have a lot to add to this. And yeah, I think it's great. I think a lot of people are actually doing long distance these days with technology and social media and how busy our lives are. So yeah, I think it'll be really helpful. Yeah, definitely. I have um, also some personal experience with this, having been in local and long distance relationships. And I think maybe we should start out talking about what are kind of the pros and cons of each? Um, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of people who are dating and they say, you know, maybe they live in a rural area or they live in a place that doesn't have a huge population, or maybe they felt they feel like they've just sort of exhausted the dating pool in their city. And they're like, yeah, it seems like there's just no one here who matches me. I'm just not having much luck in the local dating scene. So then they start thinking about casting a wider net and think, well, what if my dating pool was the entire world instead of just this one city that I live in or this one town? Um, and, you know, that is one strategy. If especially if you're adventurous or you're mobile, you like to travel or you're willing to move somewhere else if you find love, 
then going long distance can be a great option for meeting someone that you might not otherwise run into. I agree. I'd love to share my story in a brief way that kind of directly ties into everything that we're talking about in terms of long distance. Oh, yeah. Um, Everybody wants to hear a personal story. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So I did date quite a bit in New York City. I came out of a 10-year relationship in Washington, D.C., where we were local. It didn't work out for various reasons, but wonderful guy. Um, I always thought after that that local was the way to go. I couldn't imagine doing something long distance. Just after 10 years of living with somebody, sharing a city with them, it just was unimaginable to me. But as I started dating more and more in New York City, I just wasn't finding that match. And I was finding that the people I was talking to long distance, such as friends, family members, was actually spending more time with on the phone or video chat than the guys I was actually dating in my own city. And so I embarked on a long distance relationship about two and a half years ago. That did not work out because we actually didn't know how to have a long distance relationship. And I think... Ooh, what were some of the problems that came up? So we tried. Um, At the end of the day, a lot of it had to do with job flexibility. I was in a position where I really had to be based in New York and he was in California. And it just, it, for us, we needed to spend more time together to connect. We did talk all the time. We, it just, it's tough when you're in three hour time difference as well. the, The time difference is really challenging when you're both married to your jobs in your cities It can be hard, but I'd like to juxtapose that with my relationship that I'm currently in that started long distance, also in California, that when I embarked on this journey, I never thought that it would work. I mean, I'd done long distance. It hadn't worked. I wasn't really that keen on trying it again, but the difference was I had job flexibility and he was completely dedicated to making it work. So I think when you have all of these little pieces, when you have two people that'll do whatever it takes, he was offering to fly me out to California. He was spending more time in New York. He was able to work out of a New York office. And so all the things that didn't work in the orig- original relationship in California were completely different this time around. He was completely 100% in from day one, as was I. We both had that job flexibility and we had the connection. And I think Mm. it's kind of a multi-tiered thing when you make a long distance relationship work. For us, after five months, we knew we had to live together. And so I picked up and moved across the country to California. It was a big, huge move. I've been here for about a month, but we were both just so, I know I keep saying the word dedicated, but it really is true. We were both so dedicated to making it work. And nowadays there's so much technology. If you're both in it, We video chatted every other day for two hours. We were WhatsApp messaging all day long, text Mm. messaging, sending each other, you know, emails, sending each other links, talking on the phone, things that neither one of us. You don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, Lauren, but I'm curious, did you use technology to keep your sexual connection alive? Did you sext message each other or did you Um, have cyber sex? Sure. No, I'm more than happy to discuss that. Um, He had never done that before. Mm -hmm. And I had. And it was actually one of the things that did work in the first relationship in California. Mm -hmm. And it took a little bit of easing into it. But we did. I mean, we didn't do a ton with video because there's still kind of some issues with privacy and finding that right platform. Mm -hmm. But yes, we did. We we sexted. (laughs) We um, had some kind of tameish video sexing, sexting. I don't even know what you would call that these days. Cyber uh-huh. sex still. Um, <laughs> I don't even know. That's so old school. It just aged me. I know. I feel like I think of the word cyber sex and I think of AOL chat. Yes. The <laughs> Typing <chat room>. one handed. <laughs> <laughs> but I think opening up, I think opening up a search for me worked and obviously for him worked. We're engaged now and we live together and you know, things are absolutely incredible. And it was hard though. I mean, I think that's something that people really need to think about when they are expanding and looking for, you know, their partner in different countries or different cities. You both have to be in it hundred percent. You have to accept that there might be times of jealousy. You're whether you're on different coasts in different cities, just even in different states. 
you, you have to be really solidly comfortable and confident with each other that you're doing this together, that you trust each other. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of emotional things I think that come into play. And when you find that right partner, naturally, a lot of that just disappears with my first long distance relationship. There was a lot of fear on my, on my part. I didn't know what he was doing out here. He's a great guy. I have nothing negative to say about him, but it just, it wasn't that right fit. And when I met my now fiance from day one, there was never a fear of him meeting another girl out here. Or what was he doing? Or, you know, there was that kind of defined confidence between the both of us. And I think that's because you're also really forced to be a lot more vulnerable when you're doing something long distance initially than when you're dating traditionally. I mean, you're getting to know each other in a city when you're living together and, you know, you can slowly unfold who you are and talk about your pasts and learn about each other. But when you're making that commitment or dedication to do something long distance, you're kind of jumping all in right away. You have to really kind of expose those feelings, your fears, your emotions. There needs to be a real ability to be vulnerable and open to each other and to really accept that not just women are going to have trust issues or fears or wonder what's happening. It's for men as well. And there has to be that level of comfort and confidence with each other and really having empathy for each other's situations. And I don't think it always works. I've been in the situation where it didn't and the situation where it did. I think it just is very circumstantial. And I say this with almost everything with relationships. And I'm sorry to listeners who think this is cliche, but I do firmly believe that timing is very important in relationships. And when you're in that right time, emotionally, physically, spiritually with your career, you can make it work. For For me, it was wonderful. I mm. So love- Lauren, I'm hearing that um, trust is important and also having the intention that you're committed to this relationship. Um, yes, I, yeah. I believe that showing some kind of commitment early on is very important to allowing a long distance relationship to grow. And I don't have personal experience. That would be more for Tatiana. But in terms of having something on the road when you're traveling, I believe that's the same thing. If anything, it's probably more so in that capacity. So there is, you also have to be very, very open with each other and very communicative. And if you're the kind of person that doesn't respond to texts right away, which I used to be, or the kind of person that doesn't check their email every day, it's likely that a long distance relationship is not going to be for you. Because so you, you might have to adjust your adjust your availability to let oh, your yes. partner Com- feel comfortable that you're going to be available, yeah. Uh, completely. And it also, I mean, in terms of time differences, there's all different kinds of long distance. I've dated people, for example, when I lived in Brooklyn who lived in central New Jersey. And to me, that was long distance. I didn't have a car. Mm. There were we were on the same time zone on the same coast, but it was almost harder than dating somebody in California with a three hour time difference. Wow. You know, that's such an interesting point that you brought up, Lauren. And I want to talk about this because when you were speaking about um, your first long distance relationship that didn't work out because you were both kind of prioritizing your work and it was also really hard to connect over the distance, that was just an additional barrier to connection it was making me think of a relationship that was not long distance. In fact, it was the, the, the most opposite of long distance that you could possibly get where we were living together, but we were not connecting because um, he was in training to become a doctor and he was working the night shift and he was just, oh. he was also working for like crazy hours, like 70 or 80 hours per week as a medical resident. And I was working on the day shift and my work hours were a lot less and I was also thinking about transitioning careers. And so I was thinking about transitioning to a, a uh, remote working or work at home kind of situation. And it just felt like we were going in completely opposite directions. He was spending more time away from the home. And when he was home, he was having to sleep. And it was really literally only for seven or eight hours a day that he was in the house. And a lot of that, I was gone and I was at work. And so it just felt like ships passing in the night. And it was really difficult to maintain our connection. And so this is a relationship that was not long distance. In fact, it was cohabitating, but there was a lot of disconnection. And so I think that no matter what distance you are apart, if you really have that intention to honor your connection and prioritize it, you can. 
And on the other hand, no matter how close you are together, it doesn't automatically mean that you're going to connect even if you're living in the same house. You still have to have that intention to work on the relationship and to keep it strong and to prioritize and value connection with each other. I think that's beautifully said and that's exactly it. At the end of the day, you really do have to prioritize your relationship and it's a challenge. I mean, it's it's a challenge when you're traveling, it's a challenge when you're long distance or when you're living in the same city and you have different careers and goals and aspirations and just timelines of things. It's I think it's a really interesting thing to think about of how you can make it work and in my experience, and I believe in all three of our experiences, it really is, like you said, that that commitment to making it work, to trying, to giving it your all, to being there at a certain time when you say you're, for example, going to have a video chat, or if you live in the same city, that you're going to have a date or a date night or something that's going to consistently build that bond and keep you connected. And I also think it's important that we recognize, and I really believe this across the board in all relationships, including family and friends, I think it's important for us to recognize when things aren't working because there is a tendency I've seen with certain friends of mine and myself as well with long distance, physical long distance relationships, they can drag a little bit longer than an in-person relationship might because you are not seeing each other every day. And if things are maybe faltering and you're not talking about it, you're not working through it, can kind of hang on for months and months past the relationship's expiration date. So I think it's it's also interesting to kind of keep checking in with each other and seeing where you're at. And like any relationship, I believe that communication is the most important thing. If you're talking about how you feel and being empathetic to your partner's feelings, then if it's going to work out and if you're on the same page with things, it will work out. You can make it work out. It's not to say long distance or in-person doesn't have its challenges. We all know it does. We're starting you know, a podcast on relationships, but I think there are ways to bypass the things that might seem very challenging when you're looking to expand your search. And there are ways that it can work. I mean, I'm not going to go into this whole thing here, but I know quite a few people in our age group and younger who've met people across the country. And one in particular, she met her husband. He was living in London, had a beautiful job in London. He was very happy with, but he had been looking and the timing was right for them. And when they found each other, they did six months long distance. He moved out here. They got married. They have two beautiful children now. And he's very happy in New York. Mm. So there's also that willingness to recognize what you have, that it's what you've been looking for and the ability as well for one person to pick up their life and and move. Because inevitably, when you're doing long distance, there comes that point where you decide who is going to move. Are you going to move to one of each other's cities? Are you going to move to a city together? That's another kind of situation that's fraught with a lot of emotional implications. But if you're being communicative and you've been open with each other about your needs and your feelings, that's also something that's very easily doable and workable. So that's my that's my personal experience with it. But mm. it's it's not for the faint of heart. I will say that. <laughs> it, re- it really is. And you really have to have a lot of confidence in your partner, in yourself, and vice versa, and and really be ready for it. You know, I I was living in New York. I was living in Brooklyn. There were lots of gorgeous men all around me at all times. My fiance lives in Southern California. There's beautiful women everywhere I look. But when we found each other, we were only looking at each other. That's it. It was like all these other beautiful, interesting, intelligent people just became background noise. And I think that's an important thing too. It's it's the readiness. It's it's the seeing that other person and recognizing, okay, this could be somebody I could build something with. Yeah, that's really great to hear your experience. Thank um, you. I'm thinking of this. Have you girls ever seen this show called 90 Day Fiance? No, oh, sure. But I know you love this stuff. <laughs> I, I love this as well. Yes. Let, I would love to hear your take on it, Steph. Oh, well, I love 90 Day Fiance. I think most people love it because it's very, uh, it's reality TV that really hooks you in. And what the premise of this show is about for anyone who's never heard of it or seen it is Americans who are in relationships with someone from another country. And there is a type of visa that you can get in America called the Fiance Visa where you apply for the visa and the person from 
wherever else can come to America and live there for 90 days. But within those 90 days, you have to get married or else the person cannot stay. And so (laughs) these people have 90 days, which is only three months, actually maybe even a little less than three months, to introduce their long-distance international partner to their family to try to get them integrated. There might be a, a little bit of culture shock because they're just coming to America, maybe for the first time. They don't know what things are like here. They have to adjust to an entirely different way of life and a, a new family and a new kind of social support system. They're often leaving their family behind where, where they were from. And they also have to plan a wedding within just three months. I mean, a lot of people take six months to a year to plan a wedding, but they've got only 90 days. And then sometimes they're even deciding, well, do we really want to get married? You know, (laughs) when the person shows up in America, they're like, you know, fighting and they're discovering uh, problems when they actually live together. And so then they're deciding, well, do we want to really go through with this wedding? (laughs) So I think it's so it's so funny because I recently just got hooked on this show also. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I, I think it's really fascinating to watch a lot of the different couples because they all have very different backstories. Yes. And I I always find that it's these couples that kind of barely know each other that don't tend to work as well. Mm-hmm. But the ones that have spent a little bit more time together seem okay. I mean, there there have been a few that have, I don't know if I'm remembering this incorrectly, but there was one couple in particular that had met, I believe, on a vacation to Jamaica. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw that particular couple. Yes. And they had spent quite a bit of time together when they were on vacation and they had seen each other a bit. And while they have that kind of typical, I don't like it, but some people kind of love that typical bickery banter that some couples have. Mm -hmm. They have a baby now and they seem to be doing great. And I, I do wonder if that's because they almost lived together before they lived together, as opposed to maybe met once for a day or two or haven't met at all and have only been chatting. I don't know. What, what's your, what are your guys take on that? I don't know. I think when it's the right person, it's going to work. You know, I'm thinking about, I don't know, when I meet people on the road, it's really hard to establish that connection. Right. And when you say, you know, you have to be vulnerable and do that commitment. I don't think that that's so easy. So I think, especially, you know, if you're seeing somebody passing in the night, I think it might just be magic that works. I don't know. I don't know if it's um something that you can capture, but definitely investing time in the person would be helpful, of course. I just think it's a little bit tricky. I agree with you on the the magic thing too. And I don't know, I've said this in my bio and I always used to describe myself as a very pragmatic person, overly rational. And, you know, I wasn't that little kid dreaming of a wedding and and all those things. I've just always had kind of a more logical perspective when it comes to relationships. And in my, in my situation, particularly, there was magic from day one. And I think that's a kind of a cute way of saying it, that, that immediate magic, because it is there. And sometimes when that's there, you can make it work against all obstacles, whether you've spent only a few hours together initially or you've done like we did and did long distance where we were spending two weeks a month together. You know, one thing I've heard about long distance relationships is that the goal should be for eventually it to not be long distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think I agree with that. Um, Especially thinking about one relationship where I was, that I was in, which was long distance with no plan to close the distance. And eventually that just didn't work. I mean, it really felt like it, it just wasn't committed. It was like, is this ever going to be anything more than a vacation once every couple of months where we see each other and have a great time for a couple of days and then go back to our separate places? And I think in the in the case of that person, they were kind of afraid. I, this is my judgment of them, but I think that they were afraid of commitment and that long distance was a way to kind of keep me at arm's length. And um, I was kind of hoping they would change their mind over the course of the relationship, but that did not happen. And eventually we broke up. I, you know, Stephanie, I think that's a really, really interesting point. And I agree with you. I think for a lot of people, long distance is almost a way to do, to kind of be in a relationship without having the intimacy. Yeah. And I think, I, I do think the reason why it's not 
always going to work in situations is because of that. And whether they realize it or not, there is that sense of, well, I have a significant other and I'm happy, but I'm not quite ready to take it to the next level. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it is that, it is that lack of intimacy, or on the other hand, it could provide a a lot of intimacy depending on the person, the situation, like you said, I, I think that's very, very interesting. I, I'm wondering just um, because it's not something that I have a lot of experience with what you ladies think about somebody like Tatiana, who's on the road quite often for gigs and shows and events, how that could potentially work. Let's, let's say hypothetically, you're somebody who travels as a musician and you're meeting people all the time. You're constantly exposed to new people and likely the people that you're meeting are also constantly exposed to new people. And if you do find that special person or somebody who might have the potential to be that special person for you, how do you, how do you make that work when it's not the traditional long distance? It's not two people sitting at their computer in their different city, but it's two people who are traveling often like recording artists or celebrities, actors. Or cryptocurrency people. (laughs) Or cryptocurrency people. I think it's really interesting because with so many remote jobs these days and people who do travel often, you see it a lot. I mean, I'm not one to really follow celebrities, but I have often seen celebrities who make very serious relationships work when one person lives in Europe, one person lives in Hollywood. I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering if those same kind of things apply as to a traditional long distance relationship. I don't know, Tatiana, what do you, what do you think about that? Unfortunately, I have an astounding amount of experience in this, uh, (laughs) in this portion of the conversation. So uh, I travel, uh, I've been traveling nonstop for about six years. And I think it's a mixed bag. I think that the fear would be, let's say I met somebody that I would like, the fear would be that I would just go around meeting tons and tons of guys I want to sleep with and and that I wouldn't be able to be faithful. I think that's completely wrong in my case, mainly because I'm really picky um, and I don't really end up liking anybody. But I also think that that's a hard thing to express to somebody because I think that sometimes I exude a lot of confidence and I seem like a boss lady, but I'm kind of a softy. So I don't really like to necessarily let somebody know that I like them. It's harder for me to do that. So having that conversation where I could say, well, you know, I am willing to commit or I am willing to settle down. I don't always need to be on the road. That is, isn't something that necessarily can come up so easily until you're a little bit further along down the line. And I was even talking to a guy friend of mine the other day, and he was shocked to hear that I would potentially move to be with somebody. And I thought that that was kind of obvious because I have this flexibility to travel. But it's also a big deal because you have a sweet apartment. So it would be like, really, (laughs) this would be like a real symbol of your commitment to give up your place. Well, my apartment is so cheap that I could probably just keep it. And then Mm -hmm. we could be bi-coastal or whatever it is that that person would want to do. However, that being said, when I look at somebody that has a nine to five job, it is unattractive because I don't necessarily want to cool my jets. I don't necessarily need to be gone for six weeks at a time, but I don't want to necessarily be stuck in one location. Mm -hmm. If it's the right person, I think that the adjustment can be made, but I definitely look for somebody preferably in my industry that I could date because they can relate to my schedule and not necessarily get upset. We could potentially go to different events together, that kind of thing. But that also comes with its own problems because then I have to see this jerk every single time if it doesn't work out. And that's happened to me more than once. And it is a real nightmare. Um, so I don't really know what the, what the middle ground is. Um, I guess you know, you just look for the magic and and then hopefully that person will be down for it. But I think that it can definitely be scary for both people getting in. And that's another reason why people need to be more open. I just think that that's really difficult, especially when you first meet somebody. Well, my advice, Tatiana, would be to have that conversation as early as possible. Basically, if you meet someone and you think there's compatibility and you don't, you're not meeting in the same city where you both live, at least have a conversation as early as possible that goes something like this. Hey, I really like you. I think you really like me too. 
I think there could be a potential for a long-term relationship here. And that's what I'm hoping for. I'm not just uh, dating you for fun. I want this to last. But we should talk about if one of us would be willing to move so that we can be together, not right now, but maybe in the future. Is that something you would ever be open to? I would be open to it or I would not be open to it. And I think that sounds terrifying. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but it's very important because, <laughs> it is- yeah. I don't know. I feel like a girl, I'm old school. I want to be, I don't want to be putting myself out there. I feel like the guy should be putting in the work and they should be pursuing that because I think when a woman is trying to be aggressive in that way, it just doesn't look right. I don't think that guys go for that. So I think that's a nice idea. I just don't know how realistic it would, I would feel doing something like that. I don't know. Maybe our Mm -hmm. listeners are more confident. But Um, would you like it if would you like it if a guy brought that up with you? Yeah, of course, if I liked him. Right. Okay. Absolutely. So you agree that it's a good idea to have a conversation like that relatively early on. You just don't want to be the one to bring it up. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, I would gotcha. prefer to not have to do that. Because it's, you know, and that's funny because I have this conflict because I am very aggressive. And in an ideal world, I would be able to be aggressive in a relationship. But I don't know. You know, I think maybe something about the Polish mom training just doesn't allow me to to reconcile those two parts of myself. Right. One of me, one of me is this little damsel and, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to get me from my castle. And the other one of me is like a lion. And I'm like, ah, I'm going to get that piece of meat. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. That's the Leo in you. That's all the Leo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I don't know. I think it's, I mean, that's something that everybody is facing, right? Women are in this weird position where now we're, um, you know, we're in the workplace, we're kicking a, I don't want to say curses, but we're kicking (laughs) ass and taking names, you know, but that's, that also makes dating itself very difficult because I think that even boss ladies don't want to be a boss when it comes to a relationship and they want to be pursued, Well, not by a stalker. I agree with you. And I wanted to... I don't know if we want to save this for another show, but I did want to interject with something um, quickly kind of on that point. I actually have always been of the mindset that the man should be the one making the first move and that I'm not comfortable doing that and et cetera, et cetera. It's always kind of been my happy place is having somebody chase me. But I will say, and again, I'll get into it longer in a different segment, but I was the one that reached out to my now fiance after we had initially met years ago. And I reached out not to say, oh, you know, I've been thinking about you or anything like that. It was just, I'm going to be in your neighborhood. Would you want to take me out for a cup of coffee? And the interesting thing, and it's something he and I have talked about many times, is that I did kind of make that first move. And once I did, he felt the need to be that more kind of masculine initiator after that. He was Mm. so appreciative of the fact that I did make the first move because if I hadn't, I doubt that we would be together right now. But after that, and I think this is where that balance happens when you're with the right person. um, After I made that first move, he took the lead with almost everything. I'm going to take you around that day. I'm going to come visit you first since you reached out to me first. I want to do this. Let me show you that I'm in this as much as you are. So I think there is a balance there because technically at the end of the day, I was the one that kind of initiated all of it. But the moment I initiated it, he kind of took over those traditional roles to show me that he was the man and he wanted me to see how important it was that he was involved. So and I so love it sounds that. like that was, you kind of opened the door for him I opened to the door. walk and you, through and it and then that. and then he was leading as he walked through. Exactly. <laughs> and and leading in a very I mean he's such a a gentle sensitive soul. He's not some kind of like macho man type, but it did give him a chance to kind of pursue me and chase me, but that initial reach out was me. And I think that's interesting just because it goes against my nature. It goes against the way I see dating, but it it actually did work. So I think it is an interesting topic with, you know, boss ladies these days and women being in charge that some men who do have that natural, they have the inclination to initiate and chase and have that more masculine personality are still shy 
and kind of don't really know how to make that first move sometimes. Sometimes they need that door open, like you said, Stephanie, to be like, okay, here I am. I'm going to show you I'm in it. I'm going to show you that I'm a strong man and I can take care of you. But they do sometimes still, even the most successful, handsome, you know, traditional men do need that little bit of, okay, I'm open to you being my man. I'm open to you chasing me. So I totally. Think well, um, we're going to talk about this on our next show. I think this yes, is this yes. is a good topic to save for a next show. But exactly. I like that so, idea. Yeah, it's a I want to talk another about conversation. This. But yeah. I wanted Stephanie. I Maybe would love we to, need to get a man for that. By the way, yes, that would be yeah. great. That would be cool to hear a man's perspective. Um, I would. Love I, that. I know a specific guy that I have in mind that is married to sort of a power lady, but we might want to get a guy that I don't know. We'll have to think about it. So stay tuned. Uh, but go ahead, Laura. You had a question for Steph. Yeah, I'm. I'm wondering um, your experiences, Stephanie, with with long distance besides the one that didn't work out, and if you feel like they can potentially be a good source to find a relationship, and how you feel about expanding that search. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think that um, you know the first thing I want to talk about this uh, is actually long distance friendships. Now bear with me because this is going to come back around to relationships. But um, I'm a person who always, when I was growing up, I was pretty nerdy, okay? And I still am. Now I'm proud of it and I own it, right? I own my nerdiness and I consider that a compliment. But um, when I was younger, I had trouble, you know, um, feeling self-confidence and I had trouble making friends and I had trouble fitting in. And so I never really felt like I was a part of the community at my school. I didn't have, I didn't have many lasting friendships. I was kind of a loner. And as I got out of school and into my 20s, I had to sort of learn for the first time how to actually have friends. And this is difficult. You know, I think a lot of adults struggle with making and keeping friendships as an adult. And sometimes I would find people I connected with in my local area, you know, at the gym or somewhere else. But there's just not as many opportunities to meet people for friendship as an adult, unless you're taking lots of classes and you're doing meetups and you're being really active about trying to meet people. And so what I would find is that sometimes I would meet people that I'd kind of connect with, but then we'd kind of drift apart and go our separate ways or there wasn't that much in the way of shared values that we had in common, right? Maybe it was like, yeah, we like to go to the same gym or the same restaurant or something like that. We can be acquaintances, but there wasn't much of a basis for friendship there. And so then I started, um, you know, reaching out to other people I had connected with in the past or people that I met online that I shared a lot of values with in common. And there was a great basis for a friendship, even if it wasn't uh, possible to hang out in person every weekend. There was a lot there that we could talk about for hours if we're just talking on the internet. And so I started developing a lot of long distance friendships. And I think this was actually really helpful for setting me up for the ability to maintain long distance relationships later in the future. Because long distance friendships have a lot of the same qualities. It's like you have to keep in touch. You have to make sure you're communicating. You can't just drop the ball for weeks and weeks on end. Because, you know, if nobody reaches out, then it just kind of stops, right? The communication kind of stops and you lose touch. And you have to learn how to use the internet to communicate with each other and to maintain closeness. You have to learn how to send pictures and share what's going on in your life uh, to keep the other person filled in on what's going on. You have to learn how to be punctual and keep appointments that when you say you're going to chat, you actually show up. Um, You have to maybe learn how to get organized with a calendar. (laughs) <laughs> so that you don't forget all these times where you're going to show up and talk to your friend. And um, you also have to get used to, um, okay, this is not a friend who can water my plants or pick up my mail when I go on vacation, but this is a friend that I can call and talk to on my computer pretty much whenever we're both awake and our time zones are lining up and they can give me a really solid connection no matter where we both are in the world. And it kind of makes the world feel a little bit smaller when you can have those relationships because you know that you can find connection through the internet pretty much anywhere. It it can't involve touch, but maybe that's okay. Maybe you get your needs for touch met another way. So um, I'm really grateful for uh, learning how to have these long distance friendships because I think it helped in future long distance relationships. 
Now, I had, you know, this local relationship where my partner was in training to be a doctor, and he is a doctor now. And um, <laughs> I wish him the best. I th- I'm sure he's a wonderful physician. I always knew he would make a great one. But yeah, it wasn't working out between us, even though we lived in the same house, because we weren't able to spend a lot of time together. Um, so, you know, after that relationship ended, uh, I actually had a podcast and I was putting myself out there on the internet. And <laughs> I met several people through my podcast who were located all in different places in the world who were interested in dating me. And now I, I wouldn't recommend that you go hit on your favorite podcaster or even think that, the, that, is, that they're necessarily open to uh, being hit on. But, you know, some people who put themselves out there on the Internet are looking for connection. And even if they're not saying it, they're open to dating someone that they might meet that way because they're going to have a lot in common. It's going to guarantee that they share some values. So, for instance, like in the crypto space, there's probably a lot of people who put themselves out there on the Internet and want to meet other people who they share interests with. Maybe they're also interested in cryptocurrency or the values that go behind it, like freedom and, um, you know, justice or whatever, you know, whatever you're interested in. They want to meet people who they have some kind of connection with and putting themselves out there on the Internet is one way to do it. So, yeah, there, there might be some people out there who you could connect with that you're a fan of the, of the stuff that they put out. And there might be a little bit of a celebrity dynamic going on where you might feel a little bit starstruck at first. <laughs> but when you talk to them, you could find out that they're a regular person and they're actually really cool and they're actually open to connecting with you. So I met people by putting myself out there on the Internet. And um, I ended up in a relationship with one of them. So this started out as a long distance relationship. But as I met this person, they were actually moving closer to where I lived. They, anyway, like independent of me, they had just decided to move to the area. And so then we were able to get to know each other as real life friends for almost a couple of years before we started a relationship. And uh, recently that relationship has ended and I've begun a new relationship, which is long distance. So my relationships over time, I've been getting more and more long distance. <laughs> and, Hopefully not such a distance forever. No. And yeah, this one is, is not intended to be forever. Um, we, we got to know each other on the internet and we fell in love that way, but we recently met in person for the first time. And I was talking to Lauren about this and Lauren was spot on with her advice. She said, if you have that emotional connection, everything is going to be fine physically when you actually see each other. Yeah. Maybe there's a little bit of a warm up or an adjustment, but everything is going to be fine because the physical connection really reflects the emotional connection. And Lauren, you were completely right about that. That's exactly what <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, we spent a week together letting the uh, physical intimacy catch up to the emotional intimacy. And uh, now we are planning on closing the distance gap very soon. So, yeah, it's again, it's one of those relationships where, like we were talking about earlier in the podcast, both of us had the intention for it not to be long distance forever. Um, we knew that if it was working out, we were going to want to live closer together. And then also we were both really committed to spending time together and maintaining a bond even over distance. And it helped that we were long distance, but in the same time zone. So that was actually, you know, pretty convenient. We didn't have a huge time barrier to get over and we weren't going to sleep and waking up at vastly different times. Um, but definitely the commitment was the most important thing in that relationship, um, keeping it strong. Oh, well, I'm so happy to hear that. And I'm sure all of our listeners are too. Thank and you. Some of them might be applying for a date with me. So woohoo! <laughs> yes, I hope they do. I mean, are you open no, to I that? Don't, I don't <laughs> hope that they do. I'm not taking applicants over the over the radio. Although I think it might make a funny episode if we get some applicants and we could just do like a dating fun game or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that anyone who puts themselves out there on the internet, they might not necessarily be accepting applications for someone who wants to date them. but who knows, maybe in maybe you'll strike up a connection with someone that way who wasn't applying to date you necessarily, but maybe you'll strike up a connection that you didn't expect and it could turn into something in the future. That's the great thing about putting yourself out there on the internet. You never know what's possible. Well, I think I'm going to try and stick to the old fashioned way. Um, <laughs> but anyway, this has been really fun, ladies. We've got to wrap it up. Um, 
But I don't know if people are digging this episode, go to proofoflovecast.com. Check out our other episodes. We are on Twitter, Proof of Lovecast. We're getting our Facebook set up, Proof of Lovecast. So yeah, you can just connect with us online. If you have any questions, if you want to be a guest, there's a contact form. Uh, Any final words, ladies, before we sign off? Um, I think I would just like to say that all kinds of relationships can work, right? But you have to have that commitment and you have to have that trust. And whether it's long distance or whether it's close, you have to make each other a priority for it to work. And in that way, you can make any relationship uh, really special by just showing each other that you are committed to this relationship and it is a priority for you and it's, it's important and your partner feels special. We need to give them proof of love. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> Thank you. That was such a perfect summary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time at Proof of Love. Go to proofoflovecast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Show me your heart.